And, now and we have, what's that? Now we're back. Now we're back, now we're back. And, and we found another uh, voluntold, and <laughs> he's agreeable, uh, although he is duct taped into the chair. So, <laughs> exactly. And so we're, we're gonna perform a memory protocol on Roger here, and we won't give the last name because that would be indiscreet. But usually, I, when I say that, I give the last name. Right. But in, in doing this, we're, we're going to talk about what we already talked about so many times. Where is memory? Where, where, what are the components of memory? So as we, as we do this, I'm going to set up a laser, like I said, it operates at a, at a wavelength. And, the, and the, the, the rays are parallel to each other. And so we can actually go fairly deep into the system, deep into the body, or deep into the brain. We're going to go into the nervous system. Okay. Right. So we're going to start with, when I, if I'm going to the back here, I'm going to start with my first area that I'm going to, I'm going to illuminate. And, and laser is called photo, photobiomodulation. That's the technical term for what laser is. And we're in the back. Now, when we talked about memory, what's in the back? What part of memory is in the back? What's that? Procedural, Procedural memory, and it's in the what part? Uh, what part of the brain? You got it. You sat next to her in a chemistry class. Sarah Bella. Sarah Bella, right? So we're we're back here in the in the area of the cerebellum. We're going to start off with that. We're going to do 30 seconds here. We're turning that area up. We're turning the cells on from the inside. We're increasing their energy, their strength, their ability to, to do what they do for a living, whatever it is they do. We're also increasing the activity of the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. What's really cool about that is, as we keep beefing this up, those cells get better at doing that higher level and they start to operate at that level rather than always falling back down. And the mitochondria, because they're operating at a higher level, the, the, the nucleus in the cell senses that. And so it says, oh, I, why didn't you say you wanted mitochondria that did a better job? We'll start putting out mitochondria that do that. And so it'll access a little bit different area of the DNA and give you a more efficient mitochondria to do that job. Okay, now we're now we're on the top. Okay, what are, where are we going for right now here? Okay, what's deep down that the that's behind the frontal lobe and deep into the brain? You already said it. You've already said it. It's the limbic. The limbic system, right? Because it's on the inside. If we were to peel the brain apart and, and look at the inside, just above the corpus callosum where they connect, you would see the cingulate gyrus, which is the limbic lobe, and you would see you would see in the back that connection, that papez circuit. Okay. Now we're going to come forward and we're going to hit frontal lobe, and I like to hit straight front, right? Because there, remember I told you there are, there are three major areas in the front that it's the most sophisticated circuitry you got, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the orbital frontal. But that prefrontal area is where you do your pondering. <laughs> it's where you make big decisions. It's where you make sense of things and, and that. It's very advanced circuitry. So we're gonna hit that for a little bit, and then we'll hit it on the other side. So they get both sides. The, some of these others were only hitting one side. Or are, are we hitting down the middle and getting both sides. Here we're hitting it individually. Okay. 
now we're going to go from the side. What was another area? That was the frontal area. We talked about the procedural memory. We talked about the limbic brain. What was that part, that one part that was long-term storage? Okay. What kind of memory is that? We call it declarative memory, right? And so I like to call it storage more than memory because it's the kind of stuff that doesn't go away, right? And it, it's in the hippocampus. And so I'm over here with a slight upward tilt going underneath the temporal lobe, deep into the temporal lobe, into the med what we call the medial temporal lobe, or the hippocampus, which you already said that one. Good memory here, right? Okay? I want a hippocampus for Christmas. Only a hippocampus will do, okay? Oh, <laughs> that's hippopotamus. Okay. <laughs> so here we're hitting the other side. And this is, this is the laser protocol that we're doing to hit all of those areas that we discussed. Uh, can you grow it without laser? Oh yeah, absolutely. Can you get extra help with laser? Absolutely. Absolutely. We see some pretty fun, fun things happen. And, and really what I do is we're hitting it with the laser, then we do other things. Imagine I taught you all those things for learning. And as you, you practice them, they worked, didn't they? Yep. And they're still working. Even though you're ancient and decrepit. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Very good. All right. So how did that feel? Mm -hmm. Didn't notice too much. Okay. Mm. On your tongue? We just did this with another patient. Push on your tongue. Put your fingers up there. We're going to test strength. Is one side stronger than the other? Okay. Go test the other side. One side weaker than the other. Okay. I'm clear on the left. So let's turn this back on and hit it with the laser. Okay, now we got that on. This side is stronger. Okay, so you can, you can feel that it's clear that the right side is weaker, correct? Okay, so you can put some pressure over there with your fingers. And you get to. Finger number 12. Okay. I'm going to come up underneath your chin here to get the medulla. Finger number 12 is in the medulla. And we're going to get both sides, but because you're activating it by putting a little pressure, we're going to get a little bit more on the side that's active. Now, the pressure, did that change the strength? Yeah, that actually did. You can tell, you can feel the difference. Okay. And what we did was we boosted the inside of those cells in that nuclear, nuclear pool so that they would be more active, their mitochondria were working better, all the components of the cell were working better. And, and, that. so, and that's the kind of effect that we get with laser. We can go inside and, and work from the inside rather than always trying to work from the outside, which is what we do anyway. Pretty cool. What questions do you have? Um, what is this? Because I didn't know any of this was coming. <laughs> Did you mention it? I knew that something was going on, but I didn't know that I was going to be oh, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know, maybe I might
might not be quite as busy as I used to be. You know, that's that's true. That might be a so are you idea. usually busy? Yes. I can get past it. Okay. All of it. Medication. Okay. Medications can have a big impact on that. And that be, have you read that those medications that you're taking have that as a secondary side effect? Yes. Okay. I've been taking two of them as a side effect. Oh, so <laughs> you're getting ganged up on. Yes. Okay, let's look at this. Look at my finger following me. That makes things worse. Mm -hmm. Did you cross your eye? Let's a look little that. bit, but not a lot. Let's look that way. Does that make a yeah. It looks like this side. When you compare the, your ability to be out here and stay there. Yeah, it's easier there. Yeah, it's easier than over here. Okay. See us? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a how Maggie. What we're going to do is I'm, we're going to turn your head that way, and you're going to keep your your eyes on my nose. I'm going to be close because I'm getting close because I want I want your eyes to converge while we're doing this, and that causes. See, if I'm back here and you do it, it, it gets the front of the brain stem in the in the mesencephalon or the mucus the top of the brain stem. But because I'm getting close, it's going to go back into center of the brain, which goes to the limbic brain, right? Okay, but then we're going to get close here, and then turn, and turn, beyond my nose. How did, did that affect the vision? Um, maybe a little tiny bit, but I'm still, still got that. Did, did the laser have more of an impact than the helmet? Um, yeah. Okay. See, that's what, it, that's what I look for. I don't ever know what's, yeah, what's going to have the greater impact or what's going to have impact at all in, in that, which is a fun part of my job. Most docs wouldn't like that. I like super But what what is interesting to me is this is a this is a really good point here. We got medications that would cause dizziness, but all these medications does everybody that take these medications get dizzy? No. Why do they get dizzy? You know, some a certain number of the population get dizzy. Or a certain number of them get nausea, or a certain number get you know, different different aspects. Why do they get that? My contention is that they have a problem in that area. What area? If you're getting dizzy, what area is causing dizziness, Doc? Cranial nerve ten, midbrain. Cranial nerve ten will, will cause the nausea. The midbrain. The the midbrain, but the vestibular nuclei. Are going to give you a feeling of a feeling of dizziness. That doesn't mean it's causing it, it's causing the symptoms, right? And if you're getting the symptoms of dizziness, I, when I see that, I said, well, there's medication. I said, well, that definitely makes it easier, but I assume that you probably already have an issue in it besides, and, and that makes you more susceptible. It's a lot the same as when, when a lady gets pregnant and she gets carpal tunnel during her pregnancy, and then she delivers the parasite, and all of a sudden she does not have car carpal tunnel anymore. Why? Because it changed not only the mechanics, but also the pressures inside her body and inside that, inside that wrist. And it puts pressure in her neck, and her 
and, 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 and all the different pressures on the median nerve, and she's getting these symptoms. But my contention is, she's going to get it down the road, right? It's the, it's the woman who gets diabetes during pregnancy. Why did she get diabetes? Total destruction of her body, uh, not only from a physical point of view, but hormonally, right? And, and her, her ability to handle sugars and, and to use her hormonal system the way it's meant to work. And my contention is she already has a problem. It's just becoming clinically relevant. Clinic, we call it clinically salient with, during the pregnancy. And watch her down the road. I'd be worried someday down the road, if she doesn't take care of herself, she's going to have diabetes regularly without the pregnancy. Does that make sense? Exactly what you already have. Accelerate too is another one that I see a lot. Uh, things speed up with medications. And I'm not, you know me, I'm not the nomad guy, right? I'm for the wise use of anything guy. But when you when you take a med, you gotta know, you know, the, what are the drawbacks of that med. Does that make sense? Well, what other questions do you guys have? What does, how often do you do your food isolation and life plan? We start, we start with 10, with 10 visits, and we work to increase that activity. Why do we do it, and I like to do it at least twice a week, twice to three times, I like three times better, where we're pushing those cells, and you read, you're an author, right, but you read a lot, and as you read, you learn something, you're making new connections within the brain. You're, you're connecting things up, we call that neuroplasticity. Well, in here what we're doing, we call evoplasticity, because we're strategically causing specific kinds of stresses on the cells to do a certain activity to force that cell to change. And so it's like the first two weeks of practice, you know? So, or, the, or let's say you've done the two weeks and now you're doing three days a week, right? In, in, in the gym or whatever. Same concept. We're doing that kind of regime because we want we want the days where they're stressing it, but we also want the days off. But well, we're mm -hmm. not stressing it because the real miracle is not what we're doing, it's what you're doing with what we just did, right? You're going home and your brain is changing, those cells are improving, you're getting uh, a change in how the DNA operates to, to make better stuff and new stuff within within the cell, getting better and more mitochondria. Each nerve cell should have a thousand mitochondria, and if and if they're depleted of those, if they haven't, uh, like let's say they're down to seven hundred, they got a problem, right? And they're they're starting to decrease. But you're also we're also dealing with increasing, changing the stuff that's outside it that supports it. You got blood flow to that cell. And that blood flow has to change. We call that angiogenesis. And so that the the capillary beds spread out a little more, become more more effective, and they become more efficient at passing good stuff out and, and, and bad stuff in to get rid of it, because it's limited by the recovery. Stress it. This is growth. Stress it. Nutrition it. Recover it, right? Stress it, not too much, not too little. Nutrition it, not too much, not too little. Recover it, not too much, not too little. And the key to growth is the recovery phase. Okay, question. Um, sure. I take uh, different supplements mm -hmm. for the memory. Mm -hmm. Now, is that nutrition in it, or what do you mean by that? Yes, nutrition? yes. Usually you're taking stuff that is really helpful in, in increasing the structure of the brain. Like, let's say, we're, we're forcing it to have to do some of those changes. Some of those changes are going to be facilitated by some of those supplements that you're taking. Some of them are going to add the ability to make energy at a higher level. All of that's really relevant in that basic nutrition, getting carbs, fats, and proteins, right? And particularly the proteins are really vital because in order to fire the nerve, you have, you have to go through what's called the immediate early gene response, which I call cellular housekeeping. So mitochondria goes bad, you got to get rid of it, and you got to make a new one. But you have to fire the nerve in order to make that happen. So you fire the nerve, and you make a new mitochondria because of that, 
because you use the DNA, but you have to have protein in order to do it. Make sense? Yep. Okay. I always look at myself as having a lazy brain. Okay. I don't, I can't push as hard as some people do. I reach a certain point and I'm just disabled. Uh -huh. Now, is it good to push yourself when you get fatigued like that? Yes and no. Okay. What, what, what I recommend is that you get the proper nutrition, number one. Because if, you're, if your cells are sick and you push them, they'll die. Okay? And so I want to make sure I'm getting the right nutrition and I'm getting supplementation in that. And then I'll push it a little bit. But I, when, when, when I see something that is an evidence of neural fatigue, like that, or, or you'll see a twitch of muscle, I've, you've seen a bunch of those, right? As we're working with patients, all of a sudden I'll get a twitch under the eye or over the eye, or or I'm getting a headache right here, we're done. Because now we can let it grow. But I wouldn't call that what you described as a lazy brain. I would call it, call it a very fatigable brain. And knowing how to build that brain, sounds like you already know how to focus. You know, you know how to attend, you know how to focus, you know how to understand. But can the brain operate at the level that will give you that that really superb ability to focus long term, not yet. But is it possible? Yeah. As long as you're alive. <laughs> it's possible, right? And and what is it when they when they took Einstein's brain and they, they literally cut it up into little bits and it's all over the world. And what they found was actually he had below average number of cells in his brain. But he had a radical amount of connection within those cells. That's really what we're trying to do. And that's why that's why we get the results we get here when, when we start to talk about like traumatic brain injuries or strokes or MS. Say, but some of that's dead. Yes, it is. But whatever's alive isn't dead. And whatever's alive, we can push, make it work optimally, but then force it to, to connect at higher and higher levels to do more with whatever's left. That makes sense. Yeah. And so that's what we that's what we talk about here is taking that brain and boosting it to to the highest level possible. And it is that. Right. But it sounds more sounds more like neural fatigue than uh, than the lack of, of the ability and, and it's a lack of knowing how do I do this? How do I build my brain so that I have a greater capacity? Because you will already have the sophistication of the circuitry to be able to do this. You've done it. You just need to be able to do it. Excellent question. Any other questions? Is there any questions on? Hmm. Okay. So how does the laser work? Over the you know, how does the laser work? How does the laser work? The the laser works by targeting specific cells. Within, within wherever we're hitting, right? And we're doing it at a specific frequency. Uh, Does it like penetrate down mm -hmm. the bone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Goes through the bone, goes through that area. So it's actually acting as mm -hmm. so. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like it, I said with the kidney, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna hit the kidney with it. Okay, and, and this is something that is on the theoretical edge of things. Imagine if you've got a wound that won't heal. Doesn't want to heal. And so we take a laser frequency that is about wound healing. And we hit that frequency uh, on the with the laser on that area and all of a sudden it starts to heal. Well, it's not magical. It's just from a quantum mechanics point of view we're bringing those cells that are not operating at the frequency they have to in order to be healthy skin cells. And we're hitting it with the healthy skin cell and, and the, the, the healing frequency for that. And we know it, where did we learn it? Quantum mechanics. So this is basic physics. Does that make sense? Maybe. Clear as mud. <laughs> 
And so, yeah, that's the, that's the kind of thing we really were doing with it. We're increasing the uh, frequency, causing the cells. Uh, so there's actually a healing frequency. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine there's, if I've got six cells in my skin, and I've got a frequency for my skin, and I hit, and I, and I, and I introduce that frequency into the cells of the skin, and some of the skin is healthy, and some of it is not. So some of it is operating at the level of healthy frequency, right? Mm -hmm. And the other stuff that's not. The stuff that's operating at that level, it goes, yeah, that's what we're doing, man. I love it. Keep it up, man. And my next door neighbor, though, is horrible. And they're running at a lower frequency, and it's bringing the resonance factor up. It's, it's dialing them up. It's the same thing as taking two tuning forks. There's the same frequency. 512, 512, and I hit this one, and I get it buzzing, and I put it next to this one. I don't touch it, I just put it next to it. And as I do that, and I turn this one off, and you can hear that one. Why? Because it resonates at that frequency, and when I turn this one on, it turns this one on. Well, that's doing it with sound. You can do it with sound. You can do it with light. You can do it with Electricity, same concept, right? But we're doing it with light, with a very specific brand of light. And because it's laser, we can go deeper. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And so that's 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 a real fun that's a real fun effect, and, and we're looking at at several cases of wound care that, uh, that are looking at. Mm -hmm. Would there be scarring then? Uh, mm -hmm. When you see Joanne next, ask her about her. Mm -hmm. She had ugly scarring because she gives a lot of plasma, right? A lot of blood. And ugly scarring on both arms. And she's got before, after, after, after pictures that are stunning, stunningly different. Yeah. But yeah. She's got it for her scarring. Yeah. But it's basically skin. Would it help if I try to get the if I had a stroke due to this? Mm -hmm. Would it be helpful to get the uh, intervention? Absolutely. Part of the brain. Right? Absolutely, because then I I have a I'm I'm really good at you know shooting, but when I don't know exactly where it is, I'm not quite as accurate. So the the more accurate I can be when I know where that part of the stroke is, I can hit that area even more accurately. Oh, Hopefully you can tell. Oh, I know where the apple is. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Okay. I can see, I know where the apple is. I don't know where it is. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. That would be fun. That would be fun. And what, I, what I'm really excited for you is to boost those areas of the brain that tend to be particularly important. I see, because it's, it's like my grand, my uh, my son's, my nephew, he came and he was, and I'm just lazy. I said, I don't think you're lazy. I just think your goals are weak, <laughs> right? If, because you don't have something mm -hmm. that's so exciting to you that you pop out of bed, you can't wait to do whatever it is you want to do. So you haven't found that yet. I said, you find that, you already know how to work. You just don't do it that often because everything's kind of boring right now. It's kind of cool off. You're, you're wandering generality. You're not going anywhere. But when you find that thing, you know, you're going you're gonna to tear it up. I said, well, this is the same kind of thing for the cells. The cells are, oh, I'm operating at this level, and I don't know how I'm supposed to act. And, and the other cells that are healthy are going, you did it before. Why don't you do it again? And the cells are going, those those tired cells are going, maybe I did, but I don't remember. <laughs> and so we go, and they go, whoa, yeah, I remember. That's why I think a lot of conditions that we tend to look at as war, I don't see them as war. I see them as missionary work. Imagine cancer. Now, this is all theoretical. Yeah. Imagine cancer. And we attack it like it's war. 
we're going to cut it out, we're going to phenotox it, we're going to irradiate it until it's dead, you know, we're going to annihilate it, right? But those are all cells that used to do their regular job. DNA-wise, they know how to do that. They've just switched and they're doing a different thing than what they were patterned to do. So why don't we go and remind them how it used to be, what they used to do. And if you can remind them what they used to do and we convert them back, they can see the wisdom of going back, they go back to being whatever cell they were. If they're a kidney cell and they've now become a benign tumor, which means they just make more of a cell, they just go through that rapid mitotic growth without, without, the, without the other phase, with a, a division without growth. If, they just keep on making more of itself, and that's why it's easy to get those benign tumors out because they stay contained. But malignant is where the cell changes, and I'm making more of myself, but then I slug you, and that's me, and then you become malignant, and then you slug her, and you may you all make more of yourself, and that's why it's hard to find. But what if we were to find you guys, us guys, and remind you what it was like to do whatever it was with, with your kidney cells to do kidney cells, right? And all of a sudden we go, why not? We used to do it, and it was actually kind of a little bit better doing it that way. And then we go back to it, and what, what do we become? Kidney cells again. <laughs> and that's, that's what I think the, the way to the future is. And I see later the potential for it. Um, can you teach that teachability? Okay. Um, what causes genetics? Excellent question. I just did a video on that uh, for YouTube. But it's a hallucination. All right, that's simple. Uh, so that means all the others the other group and the other group. Uh, confessional, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can do it. But, but what's happening is the brainstem, the top of the brainstem, where you hear that, that's coming in, it's going in your ear, it's getting trans, transduced from a, a sound wave to a percussive wave on the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. And then it's getting translated to three little bones that are resonating. And then they hit a window on the cochlea and, and then it causes pressure on water and that frequency it resonates the water and it goes and that water freak all those frequencies is there are little hair cells that are at each frequency and they get it's kind of like playing a piano with those those little hair cells and you're getting all those frequencies at the same time and then you're translating that that into electrical impulses that go in your brain stem to the area to the to the nucleus where you hear with it right or that you receive the hearing. That goes up to the top of the brainstem, or the bottom of the brainstem, uh, the, the midbrain. And it gives you the sense of the, the texture, the sound texture of this room. You're hearing me talk direct, but you're also hearing my, my uh, bounce off, you're hearing the radio, you're hearing everything else. It's giving you three dimensionality. Then it goes to the temporal lobe. 60% of it goes to the opposite temporal lobe. 40% goes to the same side. Well, those temporal lobes have to operate at the same frequency. Now we're back to frequency, right? Those temporal lobes, we're not talking about the hippocampus, that's deep. We're talking about the outside, that, that where you, you have taste and smell and hearing, right? And so if one of those parts of the system on one side compared to the other, that, that entire system is off compared to the other, if there's a sensory mismatch, we call it, you're going to create a hallucination, what we call genetics. Or tinnitus, however you want to pronounce it. I like this, the tuna uh -huh. The two different tuna floors. And then disharmony is creating a So can you use the laser to improve that? I can use the laser to try to bring it back into frequency. And if that is the major issue, remember I say I hear a lot, I don't treat the what, I treat the why. And if that's the why, 
besides the what? Because the 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 what is being caused by that sensory input, and it's a hallucination. But if that's also the why, it's gone. It would be gone. If it's the what, it would go away and then it'll come back. And there's something else I need to figure out. Yeah, we have a, a patient who we take care of, and within three days, her cannabis is gone. She was pretty excited about that. That doesn't always happen. We're, we, we're, we're, and plus, all my patients, tinnitus is usually a tiny piece of the problem, right? I'm taking care of people who ran off of work for 10 days, multiple failed back surgeries, scoliosis, I'm taking care of traumatic brain injuries and strokes and all kinds of autoimmune disorders in LA. And, and usually tinnitus is just one little piece of the problem. But it's it's one of the things that I work through. Cool. So tinnitus I would consider not the He's saying that it's making him crazy. I don't know, it's been my observation that you probably know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it has made him crazy. It's made me more crazy. Than <laughs> yeah, that's like when I say to my wife, I was yelling at the kids, I, you're driving me crazy, I'm going crazy. And my wife will say, go. <laughs> and I'll say, all right, done, gone, went. <laughs> Long ago. Before we, before I ever got married. <laughs> so, excellent questions. Any other questions? Laser was on mental. That was uh, what we were talking about with uh, my little ninety-four year old dementia patient. We're talking about pretty pretty progressed. We're talking about stage six, seven. She, I would put her in actually stage seven. There are only seven, seven stages, and when you when you get to six and seven, man, it's bad. It's ugly, and for her, it was ugly to say just sounds, no connection, uh, just no a peeing and pooping her pants, and and uh, uh, unable to take care of herself. She had to be fed, and that within just a couple of weeks, she was no longer laying in bed or pants or that. And then after uh, after a while, she was getting up and, and changing her clothes and, and, and then eventually uh, fixing her own dinner and that. But when when we started with the low level laser, I was hitting I was using straight on the temporal lobe and it really wasn't doing that much. It was the first time I had ever used a laser on it. And the hippocampus is deep. So I said, well why don't we do this? And and I went underneath on this side on the left side and she had maybe said one word at a time, and it was kind of mumbling. And I, you know, within 10 seconds of starting a laser in that area, she turned to me and said, I want you to stop doing that. Now she says things like, uh, could somebody kill that guy? That was a good one. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm gonna get my, my, my husband and my brothers to beat you up. But, what, the other day you were there, she called me stupid. You're stupid. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Right? And she, she, oftentimes when I'm doing the exercises after the after the therapy, she'll back fist me in the face over and over again. <laughs> and that she usually wins right now. <laughs> and that, but the laser is how I start her. Right? I get her in there and I I turn on those cells. Now I can do other therapies. At a higher level, I mean then that's what I'm doing with you, Jesse. Right? I'm turning all that up so that so that when we do what we're doing, it works at a higher level. We should talk to Roger and what's his name? Going down fast, and that's that's really sad and that's harsh because 
when they come into the office, when I'm catching them at phase three, oh my gosh, it's a different world. It's so much easier. The patients usually wait, and particularly, they get brought into me at, at level six, you know, they're at level six, and, and they're, they've lost their personality. They're more like a robot and, and that. And, and uh, you know, the, the kids are crying, saying, oh my gosh, I lost my mom, and she's right here, but she's not, and she's gone. And, and they're saying, gosh, I wish you had brought her in five years ago, you know, when you, she was getting a clue that something was different. We could at least check, because whatever I have left, we can work to keep. What's dead ain't coming back, right? The longer we wait. But like with, with Martha, the things that we're doing are taking whatever is there, and we're, we're at the point now where we're boosting the connection of what she owns, what she already has. And it's making a big difference. Those kids are still getting out sometimes. Yeah, well, that's and good. Still part there. That's she's good. Still, she still has her personality. Okay, that's good. That's yeah. positive. But so she's, she's more like in four, five, five, six in there. She'll tell you a story and then a couple of months later she's telling me the same story. Same story. You really ought to talk to Rod and see if you can say, you know, go down to the river and have her come in and see if you can get your average off. Yeah. I would talk to her about it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, yeah, it's, I really love the new patients here. Usually, especially when they're, when, when they're starting to get bad, it's going to have to be the family visit. And the family's going to have to be motivated. By telling us, well, you've got to, this is this is a lot like a behavioral disorder. But it is, right? It's it's it, what I what I always say is the kid with the developmental issue, right? Uh, autism, dyslexia, and that is exactly the same as the old man with dementia. We're the same kid, right? This this kid has no control over his emotions. This kid has no control over his emotions. This kid has trouble learning. This kid can't learn. Right. Can't remember anything. Yeah. They're the same guy. He's building. He's done. And so I deal with them basically the same kind of way because it's the same issue. And so boosting it, getting it to function better, and that with him I've got a lot more to work with. But then I have to, on him, I have to cause connection. Because the cool thing is, like when we do stuff, and all of a sudden they brighten up and things get really good. That's that's fun because all of a sudden, and I've had several times, you know, where there are family members that brought you know a mom in, and she's gone, and we we turn her we turn her on, right? Her spunk comes back, her sass comes back, her smart ass comes back, you know, and and she's all she's all there, and they're crying. And they say, well, "You're a miracle." And I say, "No, I'm not. I just stepped into a room and turned on a light." That's all they did. The real cool stuff I do is when with the stuff that's gone, taking what's left and maximizing that. That's really the hard part, and that's where I really shine. It's taking whatever's left and, and optimizing. And it's so fun too when people come in and they'll have MRIs, CAT scans, or whatever, and they're and they're they been to these neurologists and that. Oh my gosh. They, they told me about all this dead stuff. I said, I know. This this is how this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. But look at everything else we got left to work with, man. We got a ton of real estate. We got all this all these healthy, strong cells to work with. And and they're going, Wow, <laughs> this is totally different. I said, I know. Because they're they're the gloom and doom people and say, This is what you have and you're screwed. I look at it and say, yeah, you've got those challenges, but look at everything else we've got left to work with. Let's see how far we can take it with what's left. What, what, I mean, what do you have to lose? <laughs> you can let it all die if you want. Do you even know that you've ever heard of Big Bigger? Huh? Yeah, I loved it. Mm -hmm. and there was a uh, part where there was a family that had the child that was. Supposed to never be able to function properly. Uh -huh. 
You know what else about Z? Before he died, he actually had a brain injury. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had to he had to go through, and he, and he said, you know, he said about it. He said, I have a special appreciation for not only brain injuries, but people that get their brain hurt in, in whatever way, you know, because totally it totally alters your world. Your brain is a predictive mechanism for neuroscience. That's, that's what we say in neuroscience. What is a predictor? It sees patterns, and it recognizes patterns that it's seen before, and it predicts the future. That predictive mechanism is your personality. The greater the prediction ability, the greater the, the circuitry that all works together to make that happen, the greater your personality. The more vibrant, the more texture it has. So imagine if we damage the predictor, the different parts of the predictor. Is that okay. going to have an impact on the personality? It always mm -hmm. does. And so my job when I'm putting those things back together again is to restore the predictor, the different parts of the predictive machine, and its ability to do its predictive job. And when we do that, and what I always hear from the family is, wow. She's like she was before. We got something. We got the predictor back, back to joy. So the other thing in, in neuroscience is we, 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 we say that the, the personality is the predictor turned inward. Well, your thinking is your movement turned inward. Because you don't have thinking circuitry. You have movement circuitry that you think of. And so you turn on your movement circuitry and now you can think. You say yeah. that again. <laughs> we learned this from Roger Sperry back in 1852. He said, and he's the guy that did the split brain studies with the, with the, the epilepsy and the kids and that, Caltech. And uh, the, what, he, what he said was we used to think that thinking allowed us to move, allowed us to plan, allowed us to do these different things. And he said, now we know very clearly that that we, we think because of movement. That it's thinking circuitry turned on, or that movement circuitry turned on that allows us to think. Your frontal lobe is about movement. It's the motor cortex. It does a motor movement, right? And so you turn that on to do different kinds of movement. There's two major kinds of movement, right? The non-emotional kind, right? And the limbic kind, right? Limbic lobe, you peel the brain in half, Right, that singular gyrus, limbic lobe, right? And if I do this, it's it's hijacking the same pathways as this one, different circuitry, hijacking the same pathways and causing a different kind of smile, different tone uh, of the muscles in my face. You look at your yearbook and you can say, I was really happy then. Ooh, I was not happy then. I was mad then. And I was forcing a smile. You can see it. Well, you've got the limbic movement and the non-limbic movement. And we turn that on and that allows us to be able to think. When you think about what you ate three mornings ago, can you tell me? Well, oh, there we go. How did you get there? You didn't even have to get there. Your eyes went to the left. It's a gear shifter. And, and people say, well, it's this side or that side. No, no, I don't agree. As a neurologist, I say, everybody has their own strategy. So how do I do it? I elicit their strategy. I used to do this to my son. I say, I would always ask a question that I knew he was going to tell the truth on. And then I watch his eyes. 
hey, uh, Dallin, you were, you had a cross country meet. How were your legs? You know, you know, you know, you know they stiff or tight or, or tight, tight? Oh, they were really good. They really felt good. Great. Now the real question. You had the truck last night and the curfew was 1030. Did you have the truck in before 1030? And all these goes, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Say, hey, how do you know that? Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. And so you're using movement to create thought. Just like you just said. And so we're going to talk about, you know, and so we get together, we're going to talk about ways to accentuate that, to accelerate that, to capitalize on that technology that we're going on. Right? How do I get you know, way more out of that? Not just so that I can do it longer, but access deeper pools of creativity that we haven't been able to get to. You ever hear a wind winder? You wrote the book Einstein Factor. Did you hear that book? Yeah. It was very popular, brilliant book. And I actually talked to him a couple of times. He has an amazing deep voice and a really nice guy. And uh, yeah, and he talks about different ways. He's, everybody thinks he's a super learning guy. And he is. But he's really a creative thinker. He, he does a lot of a lot of uh, uh, consulting to major think tanks. There's a kind that I watch it from DC, and, and they're they're trying to solve very high level problems, and they'll they'll hire him to come in and to walk them through different processes to access creative solutions that they never even thought of, never even thought possible. And so I'm actually a little more interested. About that, than even this this hyper learning concept. Because imagine if you could if you could really think so far out of the box. You know, you're you're not just out of the box. You're on a different planet. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that we do. And so we have games to play that will increase creativity. And it's fun because they not only can increase creativity, but they also increase verbal skills. And I do because they show there was a story there was a there was a study at Cornell that this for certain exercise, one of these exercises that I did out, one of these exercises, they were increasing for every ninety minutes of this exercise, they were increasing the IQ by one point two points. Well what it's doing is you already have a high level of vocabulary but you can't use all of it verbally. You can understand, you're taking, you're taking stuff from your, your actual understanding vocabulary, and you're boosting it over, or you're pushing it over to a usable vocabulary. Now I can use it. Somebody used the word, I know what it means. So I would say that there is room for more understanding. Because I have, uh, I can understand more than I can see. Yeah. And so now we can take that and turn it over. And so I would have I would teach you this exercise and I would have you do it instantly. And it would start taking vocabulary and boosting it over from understandable All right, any questions? Any questions, Doc? Nope, just Johnny is watching. Johnny! Johnny! Love you, buddy. All right, any other questions?
I gotta go and fix my breath.